Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, I'm here today with a guest that I've been trying to get on for a long time now. I'm really excited about this, uh, Dr. Brianna Jackson. Hello. Hello. And welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, I, I was just telling Dr. Jackson this. Uh, I came across their video as I was preparing for a high school class that I was teaching on ancient Egypt. And of course, I teach high school like practically everyone is super interested in video games and uh dr jackson's channel was just like a gods like it was just you know straight out of the field of reeds or something like that i don't know <laughs> it was it was perfect yes so Thank you. <laughs> um i would highly recommend it if you're interested in egyptian history if you're interested in video games whatever uh i'll link the description to the channel and dr jackson welcome thank you for Thank you for coming on. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here and, and, and chat. <laughs> awesome. So how about you start, it off, start us off with just a uh, general introduction to who you are, who you are as a researcher, your professional slash academic background. All right. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a fun story to tell. <laughs> um, so yeah, but currently uh, I am just uh, about a little bit over a year out of my PhD program, so hooray! <laughs> and it's hard out after the, the PhD, so you're, yeah, you'll find that out <laughs> real, real soon, right? Mm -hmm. um, so right now I am teaching at three universities. Uh, two of them are in New York City. Um, so the Pratt Institute, which is more of like a, an art and design architecture kind of school. Um, I'm, so I'm in the history of art and design department and I teach um, art history there uh, as a visiting assistant professor and I'm also teaching at um, CUNY. Um, so there are a bunch of different schools within CUNY which means City University of New York and so I teach at Baruch College in the history department where I am an adjunct assistant professor. I have a bunch of titles. <laughs> They're all different too. And I'm like, wait, which one is this? Um, and there I am teaching Roman history and I'm hoping that they'll let me teach Egyptian history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then finally, I am teaching at um, University of Hartford in Hartford, Connecticut and I'm teaching mm. um, Egyptian art there. Awesome. And so your PhD itself is in Egyptian history. Right. Yes, uh, uh, Egyptian art and archaeology. So I went to an okay. art history school, the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. So it's it was quite heavy on art history. It wasn't always fun because it was art history that I wasn't particularly interested in. You know, I took a course in uh, French Renaissance art, for instance, and and, and mm. it's like, mm, it, it's fine, but where's Egypt? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I got my PhD in that with a sort of minor, um, unofficial minor in uh, ancient Western Asian art and okay. ar archaeology. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the questions my students wanted me to ask you is they, they understand the fascination with Egypt. I think it's Egypt's kind of intrinsically fascinating. Um, but what got you into Egyptian art, like over and against you know, general Mesopotamian art or Roman art? Like, what was it about Egyptian art that kind of caught your attention? This, this is one of those stories I love to tell. <laughs> you know, most people, you ask uh, other Egyptologists, so when did you decide you wanted to be an Egyptologist? And they'll say things like, when I was seven years old. Um, for me, I didn't want that. I wanted to be anything else. Uh, I wanted to be a, a ballerina, a farmer. Um, I settled, not settled, I, I mean, I was really interested in it, um, veterinary medicine. So when I applied to universities, I applied for animal science and biology, and I got into... Really? Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I got into the University of Illinois in the in the Southern one and in um, Chicago one. And I had a scholarship set up for animal science in Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois. But I was, I had to pay for my own living expenses, and, and mm. so <laughs> I couldn't move down there. Um, so it just because of circumstances, I ended up in Chicago. So if I had gone to Urbana-Champaign, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and also at the time, I was interested in the French language, and I had taken French mm. in high school. 
So when I got into university, I was taking the fourth level French in, uh, in, in my first year. And so I thought, oh, this is so great. Now I want to be a French major. <laughs> and so the whole time that I was there, I was um, taking courses in ancient uh, civilization. Mostly it was Greek, ancient Greeks, uh, ancient Greece that they were doing. Mm. Um, but there was a course that I took about ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian literature and religion taught by Nano Marinatos, whose father was very famous. He was the one who discovered Thera. So I feel famous by association. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she was, uh, she started talking about the concept of Maat, which is mm. the ancient Egyptian concept of, of order, uh, justice, truth. And she, and I remember the question she asked the class, she said, why is nature just? Hmm. And I, and I knew it because I used to spend every summer in, in my mom's garden, just watching nature. And I just remember uh, seeing how everything just kind of fell into place. You know, the wasps, you, you'd see that, you know, they would act this way and, and squirrels would act that way. It was just, it was really weird. Everything was, was interconnected and, and um, uh, and so I just, I, I automatically knew the answer to this question. And I was too shy. I'm not one of those people who participates in class. But I'm <laughs> way too anxious to do this. Um, I'm always worried I'm going to say the wrong thing, um, which is, it's, it's stupid. Don't ever think that, you know, guys, it, <laughs> all of you who are watching, speak up. Doesn't yeah. matter if it's wrong or right, do it. Um, or at least try or whatever. <laughs> Don't be like me. Um, so she was asking other people in the classroom and they were all getting it wrong. And then internally, I was just like, I know, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so finally, she, she gave that explanation where, you know, everything is everything in nature is resigned to its task. Mm -hmm. And then she said that the ancient Egyptians called this Ma'at. And it was that moment that I mm -hmm. knew I'm going to be an Egyptologist. And I changed my major to classics. They didn't have Egyptology. So I just, boom, changed the classics. It was October of 2008. Uh, I was uh, working as a children's librarian at the time, so I was actually quite set up for life. Um, I didn't have to worry about what am I going to do after college. I, I had a full-time job already, but I just I got rid of it. I changed my major, and I took the biggest risk ever <laughs> and just uh, pursued Egyptology. Wow, that's a very interesting journey. Okay, <laughs> was not expecting that answer. Um, <laughs> so we, we kind of talked a little bit about this in the email conversation that we had. But uh, like I said before, one of the things that drew me to your channel was how you utilized video games to talk about um, ancient Egyptian history and ancient history in general. Um, I believe what you call archeo gaming. Mm -hmm. So, and like for me teaching high school, like video games are ubiquitous. Like they're all over the place. Uh, everyone plays them, everyone's familiar with them. Uh, but for some reason in academia, there's this reluctance to accept, like you can major in film studies, you can major in, uh, you know, art history, and you can spend your entire career dedicated to certain portions, examining certain types of artwork. But for some reason, video games have gotten a lot of pushback. And maybe it's just because they're new, historically speaking. What what opened you up, or were you always open to exploring video games? Like, when did that connection happen? I'm curious. Ah, oh man, we're about to talk about Mist. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Your fault. <laughs> um, but first, uh, there there is a um, and they're they're very rare, I would admit. Um, but there are video game studies disciplines in mm. some universities, which is really awesome. But yeah, it is something that's very much under the radar. Uh, for for me, I um, well, I used to play computer games when I was in school. We would play. The Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you remember that in sixth grade, yep. we spent a lot of time getting typhoid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was also a game called Super Munchers, which I liked. It was this little mm. monster that would eat words. Yeah, that was, that was good times. <laughs> um, Sim Farm was my favorite game. Mm. I had a farm going for a couple of years. I had millions of dollars. Yeah, it was great. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so that was in the 90s. But my, my first 
I would say real game, not that the other ones weren't real, but the first really intense game that I encountered was in uh, 1998, the first time I ever played uh, Riven, which was uh, it's the sequel to Myst. So yeah. the game Myst came out in 1993, and that like it broke the record of, of game sales. It broke the record for a lot of things. It was, I think, the first game on CD-ROM. Um, and Riven was the sequel, and my brother had gotten it for, for me and my other sisters for Christmas in 1997. It came out in October of 97. So finally, we were allowed to play it in the summer of 98, and I remember walking into our computer room. We called it the den. <laughs> and um, my sister was playing the game, and, and the first image that I remember was of the, the houses in Riven. And it is just, it's burned in my memory. I have a poster of it in my bedroom. Uh, so it's, it's, it got this really nostalgia uh, kind of thing um, behind it. And that was, that was my first encounter really with games. And I hadn't played any other ones until several years. I mean, I played the, the, the Myst series. I was obsessed with it. Uh, totally obsessed. I actually have an Archeo gaming video about Myst. <laughs> Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> and if you're interested, I could tell you about that. Um, yeah. But uh, I didn't start playing other games that were non missed until 2004 when I played Pharaoh, the city builder mm. game, for the first time. Okay. Yeah. I've heard of it. I've never actually played it. Oh, um, it's fantastic. They're doing a remaster right now, which will be coming out soon. Um, so, Is it like a SimCity esque yeah, type yeah. game? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and that's actually the focus, uh, my, my focus on uh, Archeo Gaming Studies, because, uh, I mean, I guess, I, I don't know if you want me to jump into that right now. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, in 2014 is when I first got the idea, independently. And, and when you talk to anyone who's in Archeo Gaming right now, they will tell you, oh, I came to this idea independently. And slowly but surely, I found somebody else who was interested in this. I'm like, oh, you do this too? Oh, I do it too. But this is something you had to do, you know, in clo behind closed doors. Because <laughs> right, in, in right. academia, they were like, oh my God, you play the young games. Like, it was, <laughs> especially in, in my art history school, I don't mind calling them out for being total snobs. Um, they, they looked down on anyone who would play video games. Like, you're some kind mm. of a loser or something. You know, there was still that, that stigma, you know, the stigma right. that's attached to this which is terrible, it's, it, no, it's, it's completely untrue, that, that old world uh, stigma and video gamers. Um, and so in 2014, uh, this was already 10 years of me playing Pharaoh, and mm. by now, now that it's past 2008, when I decided to be an Egyptologist, I started to see how this could be useful in uh, teaching about the development of the state, urbanization, and power systems. Mm. And so I wanted so badly to, to make a class teaching students about this through the game. But this wasn't yeah. a thing <laughs> until right. like a couple of years ago. Um, so finally, I have this opportunity now to, to do that. And, and I actually just got accepted to the ASOR conference where I'm going to be speaking on this topic awesome. uh, in, in the late autumn. So Very woo. cool. Very <laughs> exciting. Yes. Oh, that's great. So, um, what is your what is your philosophical approach to archeo gaming? Like, what do you think? I, I do kind of want to talk about like, especially because of your art history background, uh, maybe like video games as a form of art itself. Um, but like, what is it about video games? that is useful in explaining or understanding the past? It really does depend on the game because there are some out there that, ooh, they're kind of, you know, <laughs> they go in the, the stereotype route and you don't, mm. you, can't, you can't, I mean, you can use that to teach what isn't true about antiquity. <laughs> like if, you, right. if you're playing a, a Lara Croft game, you can say, well, mm. we don't go around wearing these booty shorts because, <laughs> You're gonna get sand or or mud everywhere. You don't you, mm. you, you want to avoid <laughs> getting it into places you don't want it to go. It's gonna find its way there anyway. I, I can attest to this. Um, yeah, even with 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 mummy dust. I, one <laughs> one season, I was dealing with a lot of like mummy parts. God, that sounds so awful, and I feel bad what? saying that. Really? But, 
Um, just because, I, I hate the term mummy. Um, it, it just felt so, it feels so objectifying of the, the people. Um, so mm. the, the mummified remains, um, we had um, a bunch of these that we had to, to package because um, they were just lying around in baskets, which is awful. Uh, and so I just got covered in mummy dust, we're calling it. So it's basically like uh, linen bandages and, and not necessarily human skin or anything like that, but it got everywhere. I was wearing a mask, it got inside my mouth, but yeah, it was Oof. a nightmare. That's why, yeah, the, the Lara Croft wearing what she's wearing, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna happen. But you got to worry about, you know, getting sunburned and everything. <laughs> um, but it, it also depends on where you're going. Like if you're in, in Egypt, it would be inappropriate culturally to wear something like that. Um, so, I mean, you can use it to teach what isn't true about antiquity. But then there are games that, that do very well because they, they might um, consult experts mm. to, to maybe review something or just to, to give their opinion on something. Um, and so they usually, people like this, uh, developers like this will actually try to create something that you can learn from. Uh, I did uh, an interview with several indie developers and, and I asked them a series of questions about, you know, how do you feel about scholars using your games as learning tools? And they you know, said, well, that's awesome. Uh, that's, that's not our original, original intention. But they did, the ones that I interviewed, um, did want to convey a, a reality in the games. Um, so, yeah, you have to kind of pick and choose and, and really test which, which games you're playing and see, and see what, what, um, what kind of stuff they, they've got in there. Uh, so, for instance, there's a city builder game, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not sure if, if you, it's, it's very new to an indie, an indie uh, developer. Um, and they do something really extraordinary that I haven't seen in a game before. They have uh, every single mission. They have a history of the archaeology of this particular site. So it's a city builder. What it does is it goes through the history of Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. um, and so each mission that you advance to, it's a new city. And so you develop uh, you know, a new type of agriculture or something like this. And so they, they name these um, missions after time periods mm. that um, scholars assign to various stages of Mesopotamian history. So they include in this, not just the history of the site itself, but the, the history of the archeology span of the site, which is never oh, wow. seen in the game before. I thought that was yeah. absolutely brilliant. And so you can actually use that as, as an educational tool. And, and you know, it, it's, um, I have also worked with Safe Ancient Studies Alliance, which is a, an organization that, that popped up a, a few years ago. Um, and they have grown a lot since uh, a few years ago. And they have this, um, this series of archaeo gaming modules that they received a grant for. And so what, they're, mm. what they do is they create a, a, a video using games to explore certain aspects of ancient uh, cultures and they they send this to middle schools for mm. teachers to use in the classroom to help um teach whatever topic it's, it's on about and so so i helped with one of those on urbanization <laughs> um so yeah it, it's it's really fascinating being able to use some maybe even a lot of aspects of games uh, assassin's creed does a really good yeah. job of incorporating history. So uh, you'll see a lot of scholars currently using that, even ones that have never even touched a game before and now they're gamers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a bit of a snob about it. <laughs> kind of bitter. <laughs> you have every right to be, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, it does. Okay. Um, to follow up on that, one of the questions, so I utilize um, video games and pop culture a lot in the classes that I teach. To I, I get to develop my own classes, and so I'll use it to to model a class after. And um, one of the questions that often comes up, and I, I had a conversation with some of my students because uh, I had shown some of them one of your videos, and they knew I was going to come talk to you. So. 
Um, one of the questions that they had, uh, oftentimes, I'll, I'll give you a, an example. Maybe it will help, maybe it won't. But uh, on a yearly basis, I teach a class called the Philosophy of Anime, where we analyze an anime series and we talk about, we kind of analyze it in the same way that you analyze like a work of Shakespeare, but, you know, convincing a 15-year-old to read Shakespeare, impossible. Mm -hmm. But to talk with a 15 year old about anime more more likely um and so one of the questions that they had about this approach that you've adopted with using video games um oftentimes through pop media and pop culture there are uh negative stereotypes harmful stereotypes uh sometimes hateful stereotypes that might be perpetuated by the media um, intentionally or unintentionally um, to the extent where, uh, you know, I think it's a good question to ask, like, is this, is this helpful? So like with anime, there are, anime has a tendency to give very demeaning stereotypes of women, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's a, oftentimes a conversation that we have. So with video games, their question was like, I mean, they get it. They, they love video games. They play video games constantly. But could this be harmful to the academic study of the past in the sense that uh, are these video games kind of perpetuating certain ideas, stereotypes, prejudices that might take more effort for you to undo, if that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. And this is uh, something that, that has come up. In, there was a conference about, or at least a, a lecture or something like this, a panel, there we go, that's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> about stereotypes in, in video games, uh, stereotypes of antiquity in video games. Um, I can't remember any specific examples of that, but I have my own specific example. Yeah. Um, I don't mind calling out the game Pharaonic. When I saw this game, it's a, it's a two-dimensional slider, uh, I'm not really sure what the technical term is, but it's, I think that's it's something to that effect where you're just moving to the side. Um, I think I've played that game. Oh, yeah? I think so. Okay. Well, it's an indie looked, game? Yes. Okay. It looked really good to me when I, when I saw it. I was like, oh, this looks cool. And when I, when I opened it for the first time, the loading screen looked great. The... Um, the opening montage was really awesome because they were talking about the King Ahmose, and I knew that they were, you know, playing around with that and modifying that to make their own story, and I was okay with it for a while. And then we get to the building of the character that you play. At, you, you start off as a, um, uh, in most games, you start off as somebody with a lot of agency, maybe even a ruler or somebody with a lot of power. But in this game, you start off kind of like you do in Skyrim, where, where you're a prisoner or something like this. Yeah. And you get to build your character. There aren't a lot of options, but because you are a prisoner, you are given some pretty negative options, um, in my view. So a lot of the, the skin colors were, were dark, but there was one that was lighter, and it had a more positive term mm. to... That one was the servant, but other ones were like, um, oh, the southerner, and oh gosh, I can't remember, I kind of blocked it out, but one of the things that really stood out to me was the hair texture. Mm. And the curly, I am curly, um, <laughs> the curly styles were referred to as like wild or savage. Mm. And I was sitting there with my curly hair, just remembering <laughs> all of the times people told me that you should straighten your hair or mm. you should brush your hair. And I'm just, I was just looking at this and it, it immediately you know, made me upset. And I'm thinking of people with different types of curly hair texture, um, right. like Thor C type, for example, who would probably be like, what the hell are you doing with this? Um, mm. And it was it was really awful, and and I did notice that there were like certain types of hairstyles that might be attributed to certain cultures, um, and these were given kind of more pejorative terms. Mm. And so that that really stood out to me. So it, it I only played that game for thirty minutes before I finally was like, I, I can't handle this. 
yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, in, in terms of a review, uh, I don't have enough <laughs> to give a full review of the game itself. But somebody on YouTube had a review, and I watched it, and they, they, they weren't too keen on the game. And then I jumped in there. I was like, thank you for hating this game because I hated it for these reasons. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it started off great, but then it went, real, it went downhill real fast. Right. For, for me. Yeah. And... <sighs> I mean, I guess to a certain extent, like this is an issue that the video game industry has uh, probably within the last 10 years, we've seen this conversation really open up. And I think rightly so. I mean, it's not a mystery that most of the video game in industry for most of its history has been dominated and been made by white men. Yep. Right. So obviously, um, certain cultural assumptions are bound to creep in there. You might see a cat in a few seconds here, by the way. I have three, <laughs> three cats. I'm sure one of them will make an appearance. I expect nothing less from an Egyptian <laughs> scholar. <right>? <laughs> yeah, so I ask it because, like, so I've used the game Civilization VI to teach history oh. before. I don't know if you're familiar. I've, um, I've, played, I've played Civ IV before. I haven't played Civ VI. Uh, so one thing... Yeah, go ahead. No, please. Uh, I, I didn't like Civ Four just because I didn't like... <laughs> I'm so picky. Uh, I didn't like it that you could have an Egyptian civilization developing Inca cultural <laughs> technologies, <laughs> and that that bothered me, so I wasn't really into that. But I, I can understand other people being fine with it because it's not really the, the history that matters in this game, I guess. <laughs> Maybe, <Yeah>. perhaps. <laughs> but uh, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, 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 that fair point. Um, I always attempt to build the pyramids in Civ just because I like aesthetically how they look on the map. But um, what would your response be? Like, let's say that I'm some old curmudgeon that doesn't like the introduction of video games as like an artistic style or especially, you know, I don't know. I'm some big wig Egyptologist that, you know, turns my nose down at incorporating video games because of the pop culture association. I, I think the assumptions a lot of times is that they're shallow, um, that it's not artistic, whatever that's supposed to mean. <laughs> and that it would be that it's ultimately more harmful to the discipline. Like what would your kind of knee jerk reaction to that be? Oh, uh, my reaction would be to ignore them. Um, <laughs> 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 to be honest. Um, no, and I, 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 luckily I have personally not faced this from senior scholars telling me, oh, mm. you shouldn't be doing this thing. Um, for that, I, I would probably try to explain the, uh, the benefits of these games and, and you know, maybe show, bring, bring some, uh, visual aids, <laughs> come prepared with like charts or something. Mm -hmm. Um. Because if you, I think if you're just telling things to people who, who, who haven't played games and, and maybe all they know of is hearing about the stereotype, like, oh, you're, you're a lazy person if you play a video game. Mm. Um, but is it really any different from watching a documentary? No, just because it's, it's not, you know, experts sitting there telling you things doesn't mean that it's, it's invalid as uh, a learning tool. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you, you, if you saw that. <laughs> Sorry. Saw the cat, yeah. <laughs> no worries. Um, I feel like I'm answering this question so poorly. Um, no, no. <laughs> just uh, because I luckily have not faced this from senior scholars. Mm. I faced this from peers who are just like really competitive and wants to do anything to kind of undermine you. Um, not everybody, but you know, just encounters that I've had. This was how they reacted. Um, but for, I think there, I'm thinking of specific scholars that I would uh, encounter with this topic. And even though they're kind of like the, the old school sort of scholar, those ones are, they tend to be really open to new ideas like this. But it's kind of like the, the generation after them who uh, think a little bit too highly of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's be real. 
Yeah. Um, who would turn their nose up at something like that? And I think that you could try anything that you want to convince them. But if, if you are not one of the, the top scholars, uh, they, they probably wouldn't take it seriously, whatever it is you say. I mean, I'm not saying all of them, but um, I think it would be so hard to change the mind of, of, of a scholar who is more senior than you. Mm. This may, it, it sounds so awful me saying this, and I, and I, and I realize that I, I sound like a total jerk right now. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. Let me uh, expand on that. Maybe this will ring a bell because I get it a lot because I teach at an online school. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm wondering if I can frame it more so so you've had a lot of hands-on experience with Egyptian artifacts and with the remains of ancient Egyptians. Um, I do want to hear about some of the archaeological sites that you've visited. Um, I, I meant to ask you about that before. But what about people who would say that there's something... So talking about the graphic representation of, let's hmm. say, the pyramids versus... Uh, obviously, we all can't fly out to Egypt, but versus even going to a museum and seeing artifacts, that there's something inherently lost with the visual slash graphic representation. Do you encounter mm -hmm. that or do you think that there uh, are benefits to having these these objects, cities, places, people represented within a within a video game context? that the other, otherwise people wouldn't have access to or, or get? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, it, again, it depends on the game and how, how well they are representing that. But if they're just taking something that's in their imagination and saying, oh, this, 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 yeah, I saw this on like Ancient Aliens, so this must be true. I'm going to put it <laughs> in my game. And then you have a bunch of people playing it and they're thinking, yeah, that's yeah. accurate. I've had people on the subway come up to me, they see me reading a book about ancient Egypt and they decide to, this one guy told me how, uh, someone someone with a PhD, he didn't remember who or what they had their PhD in, but they told him that the pyramids were basically musical instruments. And I was like, no, they're, they're not. I didn't say anything. I just smiled and nodded. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. And he, was, he was so enthusiastic. I don't want to kill the enthusiasm, but, you know, yeah. I'm just thinking, who, who, who is doing this and where is this coming from? And I know that there was an episode of the original Star Trek where uh, an obelisk was a musical instrument. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that, but <laughs> if anybody out there is, there you go. There's, maybe that's where it came from. Um, but there are, a, you're right, there, there are some preconceptions, and I think this mostly comes from TV rather than games, mm. uh, because that is open to a wider audience, since most people would watch TV than they, than they play games. Um, with, with video games, what I have found is people will ask questions like, is it true that? And then they're more open to having that corrected uh, mm. if, if it needs correcting. Um, oh, bless, I feel like I have examples and and they're, they're on the tip of my brain, but I can't catch them. Um, that's so frustrating. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have I have had people ask specific questions about representation of, of something in a game, and it's incorrect. And I say, well, actually, you know, the <laughs> well, actually, that term. <laughs> um, and so I, I correct this, and they're totally okay with it, and, and they're happy to move forward from there. Yeah, no, that's fine. Representation of people. Do you mean like how Egyptians? I mean, this is a. Seems like a hot button, hot button topic. I, I, I get a lot from my students about how ancient Egyptians are represented, whether it's in video games or movies. Would you like to yeah. enlighten us a little bit there? Oh, man. And I think this 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 would be a nice segue into Moon Knight, which I have yeah. to say, hooray. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you think of movies like Gods of Egypt, I think that was the title, or Exodus, and they hire, you know, white people <laughs> to play these roles. And why when you have a whole bunch of actual Egyptian actors who can fill these positions, right? Uh, and then you have like the movie Night at the Museum where they do have an Egyptian man playing a pharaoh. <laughs> um, so, you know, hooray for that. 
Um, and in video games, I think a lot of it has to do with the way women are portrayed because mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I know that there were a lot of, there was a lot of pushback about Cassandra in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, and there was a lot of pushback about Aya in Assassin's Creed Origins because she was originally going to be the protagonist, like the main character, as far as I heard. But people, people yeah. didn't, didn't like this. And so now we have Bayek, which I'm not complaining about either. You know, <laughs> um, if, if I could segue into Moon Knight. By all means. It helps that they had an Egyptian director <laughs> mm -hmm. who had an Egyptian musician compose the music. We had an Egyptian actress. Uh, I believe she's, she's half Egyptian, half Lebanese, or where, where is she from? I can't remember. Um, sure. And and also she, she has curly hair, which in Egypt is is a thing. Um, just like in the US, like, you know, there there's some stigma with, with curly hair in Egypt as well. So that was a huge deal for Egyptian women, seeing an Egyptian woman as a superhero right. with curly hair. <laughs> um, so that was that was pretty major. Uh, and they showed um, some really cool uh, cultural um, very unique cultural things uh, in Egypt, like the stick dancing on, on horses. There was that mm. in one of the scenes. Uh, in the background, there was um, there, there were people speaking Arabic. <laughs> um, there was that rooftop fight scene with Egyptian actors wearing Egyptian fashions, like the, like the, the clothes that are really popular among the young people uh, and the hairstyles. That was very recognizable to me. And I was like, oh, this is so great. You know, we were, like, we're really capturing real stuff here. I don't think it was filmed in Egypt, but they, they did a really good job um, trying to capture that in a, in a studio setting. Uh, so I applaud them for that. And I know a lot of Egyptians are we're very excited about this as well. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I did want to ask you a, a few questions about Moon Knight. So most of, and slight spoilers, I don't know, um, if you're watching this and haven't seen Moon Knight, go watch Moon Knight first. Pause <laughs> and then binge right. and then come back. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's not that long. Only six um, episodes. <laughs> so a, a big portion of the plot, of course, and a big portion of Moon Knight's character himself uh, revolves around this idea that uh, he is the avatar of Kanchu. Um, and then, of course, we have other Egyptian gods and goddesses in play throughout the series, um, specifically Amet, Amit, Amet, Amit. 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 Um, so ha let's start off with like the, you know, speaking of stereotypes, the stereotypical historian critique of the, you know, pop culture film. Um, what did you like? What didn't you like? What were some big errors that you saw? Uh, what were some things that you thought they did an excellent job on? Let's start there. Um, well, I have to say that the, one of the things that I really, really liked was at the very beginning when the, the main character, who's Stephen, uh, mm -hmm. is in the, the British Museum and he's correcting everybody about everything. I was laughing at this. <laughs> I was like, it's so cute. I love it. And, and the little plushies, uh, I wanted mm -hmm. one. Uh, <laughs> And I thought that was really interesting. I thought it was interesting that he was uh, learning hieroglyphs, and I thought it was really interesting that he said hieroglyphs instead of hieroglyphics. I was I was cheering because that is the word. Hieroglyphic <laughs> is the uh, adjective. Hieroglyph is the noun. Uh, mm. My my hieroglyphs teacher has like a whole speech that he went through when I first started taking courses with him <laughs> about this <laughs> about this term. Um, so it, it was it was really cool seeing those really tiny details. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let, let's continue with the things that I really like. Okay. Uh, for for um, Moon Knight's costume, I thought that was so cool because they made it look like mummy wrappings. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so interesting. I liked that a lot. Um, and I also liked Tawaret, the hippo. <laughs> She was so great. I loved her. Yeah. Um, oh man, I'm trying to remember everything. And and as I said, I really liked the um, 
the integration of modern Egyptian culture. Um, I thought that Layla's costume was so awesome and she became the superhero. <laughs> I yeah. thought that was really great. Um, I liked the the afterlife, the, the fields of reeds that they that they were going through. Uh, mm. That was really interesting. Sorry, cats are misbehaving. <laughs> <laughs> One is trying to knock a picture off the wall. <laughs> Sorry for these interruptions. Um, but there there were some things that I got really annoyed about. Mm. And one of them was they went to the Pyramid of Giza and it was like this whole Isu from Assassin's Creed kind of set up in there. And I was like, why are you doing this? Just make a different building. Why is it in the pyramid? We know what's in the pyramid and it ain't that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I was disappointed by Osiris. I was expecting someone who was a lot cooler. <laughs> and I was telling a friend of mine, a fellow Egyptology, classical archaeology friend of mine, that the, the, the gateway um, in the afterlife for him was more intimidating than the character himself. <laughs> um, so that was disappointing. Um, oh, one thing that I thought was really cool was how Kansu, and I'm going to say it the ancient Egyptian way, not Kansu. <laughs> Excuse <Okay>. me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really liked how they, um, they, they said that when he said that he remembers every night sky uh, I thought that was really interesting because there there are Thoth and Khonsu are both moon gods and uh, there is some text that says that Thoth uh, knows all of the stars in, in every sky. I think that was the text. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that they incorporated that. And I, and I just really liked that scene when he was changing the cosmos. Um, we do have technology that can do that for us. We don't... <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go through all of that stuff, but I, I, I get it. It was it was cool. I mean, it was it was fine <laughs> to watch. It was totally cool. Um, but um, just uh, and and they they did incorporate uh, a lot of tomb art, um, yes. actual tomb art, or or a lot of uh, scenes from the Book of the Dead, especially the Judgment scene. Obviously, that would be what they would be including everywhere in a lot of the the, the tombs or other buildings. Um, they did have an actual image of Amit as she appears in the Book of the Dead because she is a tripartite composite scary creature. She is made up of a crocodile, um, a lion torso, and a hippo uh, hindquarters. So these three animals are the most dangerous animals in, in ancient Egypt. So the, these were the ones that were the, the, the most terrifying. So putting them all together to create this this monster who uh, eats your heart if it doesn't um, weigh the correct uh, correctly against the feather of Mott, you know she, she, she her name is the devourer that's what it means and so uh, she needs to be scary right yeah um, and so they they kept man I gotta say the, the the pacing on this show for me I thought it was way off uh, I was bored until episode four. <laughs> Sorry, um, but I was I was so looking forward to Amit because they kept hyping her and at my, this, the the friends uh, I had just mentioned before um, we we were both hoping for a nice hippo butt um, but we didn't get that <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was disappointing that they waited until what the last thirty minutes of the sixth episode to finally. Uh, bring her to life uh, yeah. and she was only a crocodile and I was just like okay so she's a lady Sobek because we already have a crocodile god Sobek and there could be you know, a female version of Sobek um, mm. and so instead of making her look like the actual paintings that they have of her in, in the show <laughs> they, they, they make her only a crocodile and I was so disappointed I was like where's the composite creature she could have been <laughs> So much scarier and i had a debate with another egyptologist he's like yeah but she's actually scary in this one i'm like no she's not <laughs> <laughs> um i wish that their boss fight was was longer maybe mm. she should have been introduced at the end of episode five um as a you know kind of a teaser and then all of episode six could have been like epic uh fights and everything like that i thought it was really cool how they made them really giant 
Um, yeah. That was a neat scene. Uh, but I, I was very disappointed by, by Vomit. <laughs> <laughs> Really hoping for that hippo butt. Right. We, we, we have to settle for uh, Tawerit as a as a full hippo. But even Tawerit, the goddess Tawerit, is a composite mm. creature because she also has uh, like lion legs and a crocodile tail. But the rest mm. of her is a hippopotamus, and she's supposed to be scary also because she protects against uh, uh, she protects mothers and children against uh, other evils. Um, mm. But. She was cute. I liked her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was a lot of fun. So what did you think about the, and I, you know, this might be an impossible question to answer because I know Egyptian religion lasted for a really long time, right? Uh, and the gods and goddesses, their roles kind of change over that time as they do in any religion. Um, that being said, uh, I guess on a high level, what did you think about the representations of the different gods and goddesses? Do you, did you feel like they embodied what that God was supposed to represent or that goddess mm -hmm. was supposed to represent? Or do you think, you know, granted we're talking about a superhero film, right? Getting that out of the way though, do you, were the mistakes uh, large enough to be like significant or for the most part, do you think they kind of embodied them correctly? Well, you know, the problem with that is they didn't give enough time for the other gods that we saw. We have we have Osiris, right. but we never see Osiris as Osiris. We just see him as this little guy who, who looks like, you know, he's a banker or something. <laughs> and um, the the one who plays Hathor, I mean, yeah, she, she was she was very you know, beautiful and svelte and she had the little the little horns. Um, but like her her what her personality would have been. She's the, the goddess of fun and love and sexuality, um, but she was just kind of there to move the plot along. Um, so I, I feel like they, they could have pushed a lot more with giving them personality. Uh, and I mean, Osiris is the judge of the dead. And so when you have um, uh, Ethan Hawke, <laughs> I'm just going to go, I'm just going to say the actor's name. I forgot his actual name in the show. Um, he comes in and he's not even an av like if he, he's he's associated with Amit this whole time, and they know that Amit they they don't want her to wake up. So why are they paying attention to him instead of Kansu? And and I realized that you know Kansu has a, a history of being uh, a troublesome individual, but. <laughs> He's still uh, one of one of the gods, and and Osiris is the the judge of the dead. You know, he's I was expecting him to be very judicial, and he 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 didn't do this. And I don't know if it had to do with the pacing of the show, um, or maybe they they didn't think it was really that important to to give strong personalities to these gods. But I I really wish we could have seen that, and I really wish we could have seen him in his mummy form, um, because he's supposed to be a mummy, uh, sometimes with green skin, sometimes with black skin. And it would have been so cool to see him there as a mummy with his hands crossed, holding the crook and flail, which is yeah. his bowling pin hat. Um, and, you know, Hathor is a, a cow goddess as well. Um, so it could have been cool to see her in, you know, doing something with, with cows <laughs> as a cow. Um, but no, she could take the form of a, of a, a woman just with the cow horn. So I think she, she was she was okay um, as she was, but she didn't really have a half horse personality that, that we, we don't see personality per se in ancient Egyptian stuff, but you know she has attributes that they could have portrayed in terms of a personality, which they fell short on um, what other gods did they have? They had they had Osiris, they had Hathor, they had Amit, obviously, uh, and then Kansu, obviously. I think those were the only ones that got any sort of screen time. Mm -hmm. the, a, a few others were mentioned, like when they walked through the little statue area. Yeah. 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 Oh man, it's just it would have been. I mean, uh, and Tawarit was there. Uh, she, she was fun. Um, I mean, I liked her. Oh, she, yeah, she's, yeah. she's meant to be a protective deity, um, but and, and like she sort of had this embedded in her character. But at least she had a, a fun personality that could be entertaining. But the other ones, I feel like they just were there 
to move the plot along. And I would have loved to see more. That would have been so great. And more gods, even. Like, Anubis should have been there, man. <laughs> Where's Anubis? <laughs> <laughs> he was actually the one who does the scales anyway. We should have had Thoth in his Ibis form. That would have been so cool because he's over there taking notes on everything, right? Yeah. Uh, it would have been it would have been really neat to have mm. more gods. Maybe they'll maybe they'll do more. Maybe they'll have another season and, and we'll see more stuff with this. I don't know, but mm. um, I would have liked to see more. <laughs> <with Yeah. the laughs> What did you think about the uh, representation of the afterlife that was shown in the film? Oh, gosh. So I have a vague memory of it. So um, they're in the boats. Now, mm -hmm. now, I feel like if I understood it correctly, they had not yet entered the proper afterlife, right. um, the field of reeds. So, I mean, where they were at was kind of like a limbo space, which I don't think really existed in... Um, ancient Egypt, they, they do have ancient Egyptian religion, I mean, um, they, they do have like gateways you have to pass through, which are, are challenging. Um, so I think maybe they were trying to pull from, from this concept because the, the space around the, the boats was dangerous, right? You fall in and you become the statue thing. Um, okay. So in, in this way, I think they were trying to capture the, the dangerous aspect of the afterlife, which is why you would need um, the Book of the Dead Papyrus, because it has all of the spells you would need or, and the, the instructions that you need to, to pass forward uh, into the field of reeds that is your ultimate goal. Um, so I think maybe they were going for that concept of, of, of danger with that, which I, I, I think would be cool. If, if I'm right about that, then I think it's a pretty cool um, modification on that concept. Hmm. Yeah, I was um, I was having a conversation with somebody about this. I I'm not sure, and this kind of gets back to what we were talking about with video games um, and representation with video games. Um, the now Moon Knight is a character in the comics. Going back, I my cousin used to collect comics, and I, I do remember reading some of the Moon Knight and there was this idea in the comics of Moon Knight's characters suffering from some form of like multiple personality disorder. And there's always been kind of that mental illness angle. I don't think we really have to go there as far as representation, but um, kind of going back to the afterlife bit, what I liked, and you could tell me if I'm completely off base here, <laughs> Uh, but I was on somebody's um, YouTube channel recently, and they asked me what afterlife, if, if there was an afterlife, what afterlife I would like to be real. And I said the ancient Egyptian afterlife, because it seems seems so nice. Maybe I'm not fully understanding, it, <laughs> aside from the trials and stuff. But it, it seemed like that they took uh, Stephen, I can't remember Oscar Isaac's characters. We'll just go with the actors. Um, so they, they took... Oscar Isaac's character and my understanding of the Egyptian afterlife in the book of the dead is that you have these like rituals and spells that are in the book that you're are, are there for you to perform um, after your your soul has left your body in order for this like passage to take place but that you know once these sort of like trials are gone through and overcome and uh, once your heart is weighed assuming that it doesn't get gobbled up by Amit that um, when you go into the field of reeds, it's supposed to be this like peaceful, tranquil place. Like you can work if you want to, but if you don't, you got the little clay figures yes. that can work for you. Right. But you, you chill and you, you grow your food and drink your beer. Is that <laughs> the gist of it? Yeah, essentially. And, and, uh, uh, and then people bring you food even at your, at your tomb <laughs> chapel. So they have uh, three different souls. You have the Ba, which is the one that travels around, and then you have the Ka, which is the life force, and that's the one that uh, that gets to eat all of the food that people bring during the beautiful festival of the valley when everyone has picnics at their family's tomb. And <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that's pretty much it. That, that's, that is a, a pretty nice deal for sure. <laughs> as long as you can get through those gateways. Yeah. Mm. Right. <laughs> 
So with Oscar's Isaac's character, you know, artistic leeway aside, do you you, th- you feel like that was a fair representation there? Yeah, you know what? You just reminded me what they did, how he had to go through and correct or, or, or remember everything, and mm-hmm. those were the gateways mm-hmm. that he had to pass through. And I, I just, I just, I just put that together right now. <laughs> That's so smart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought, I thought, yeah, that, that's really interesting. And I mean, obviously they're not going to go exactly according to ancient Egyptian stuff. It's more like an adaptation of antiquity, but also trying to remain true to it in some aspect or another. And uh, I think, I think they, they handled that well in, as, a, as an adaptation of an idea. I think that was pretty cool. Awesome. So one of the things I like to close out with is to get some book or documentary or YouTube channel recommendations. Um, first, tell us maybe what you're reading right now, um, aside from like journal articles, I get that. Uh, oh. And if somebody was interested in ancient Egyptian history, like what is your go-to recommendation? Just off the cusp, off the top of the head. Well, first of all, all I, all I read are... Um, uh, academic things these days right. <laughs> but i when i whenever i do get a chance to read not that i, I read children's books <laughs> but for history you will have to pry out of my dead cold hands ian shaw's <laughs> oxford in uh what is this called the oxford history of ancient egypt this is oh, my go-to uh and the, this is the paperback um that his Chronology is the only one that I use. Um, there, there's a whole debate, a whole like society of Egyptologists who, who just really go at each other's throats about chronology. <laughs> um, but I, I prefer Ian Shaw. I think this is great. We have It's not just Ian Shaw who wrote it, he edited it. So we have a bunch of different authors and it goes through the history. I just, I just love it. Um, it's definitely not the only history that you can read, but it's the one that I read, and it's the only one I'm going to recommend because it's my favorite. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, any podcast or uh, lecture? I don't want to know if I want to recommend lectures. Any uh, Egyptian podcast or kind of popular level stuff? I would recommend uh, Dominic Perry's um, History of Egypt podcast. Hmm. Um, he does a really good job. He also interviews scholars. He interviewed me. Awesome. <laughs> um, but he, he's really great. And um, he's, he's very popular uh, already. And then a YouTube channel is uh, that I would recommend is uh, Religion for Breakfast. Yes. Um, he also is very successful. Um, but he, he incorporates uh, the work of other scholars as well. Um, so he, he invites other scholars to, to write scripts for him and i wrote a couple (laughs) i'm not trying to plug my stuff i'm just (laughs) no by all means yeah um but yeah he has a really good channel um and he he luckily has uh, been able to travel around egypt a lot so he has some first-hand photos and videos that he was able to take and that he can use um so and and digital hammurabi of course big recommendation for digital hammurabi (laughs) i owe them a lot really um, Shout out. They helped yeah. me a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you interviewed them, so you know. <laughs> yes. Very um, awesome channel. Mm, and what else? What other topic shall I would you like me to recommend? Um if and my students also wanted to ask you this, uh, they are like super fascinated by the idea of like historical digs and going to archaeological sites. Um, for the, the lay person or, you know, maybe somebody that's potentially interested in this as a career and or hobby. Um, yeah. What would you recommend archaeology wise? Like, uh, like where to visit, where to visit. And let's say that you have like an undergraduate that like really wants to go on a dig. Oh, uh, if you do want to go on a dig, go to the American Institute of Archaeology. They have a whole field school section. So look through there. Um, that is your, your best bet. And they also offer like first time um, um, 
if, if you're going on a dig for the first time and you're an undergraduate, they'll offer, uh, you can apply for um, a scholarship because awesome. they can be expensive. They can be up to like five grand because you're also paying for tuition. You're paying for your flight out there, uh, your room and board. Uh, these are for field schools. Um, but if you're lucky enough and you're in, usually it's when you're in graduate school, um, you can join a dig and you don't have to pay for it because uh, they pay for you and, and you get paid with experience. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> um, so I, I worked in Abydos, which is in southern Egypt. This was the, the cult site of the god Osiris. Um, my jobs were working in the, the storeroom. So I was um, processing the artifacts that were coming back from the field. I also archived the um, field photography and also I did this surface collection projects where we were picking up all of this this rubble um, from around one of the temples that was in huge disrepair. So we were trying to make sure that we would collect all of the, the decorated pieces because they were using the non-decorated pieces to mark a pathway for tourists. Oh, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it, they're not really useful because it's, it's rubble at this point. So yeah, I mean, I guess they're useful now as, as uh, sidewalk markers. <laughs> um, so I mean, I went there. That that's the site that I've that I've worked at. Um, so I, I focus on the Amarna period, which is the reign of Akhenaten, mm. who was always on TV as the alien guy. He wasn't an yeah. alien, okay? <laughs> no. Um, so I was so excited to visit Amarna for the first time. And I went there and there's nothing there. <laughs> because I was expecting to see all of the buildings uncovered. Now it's only the foundations that remain. And I was, I was thinking that they were still all uncovered, but no, they've been backfilled. And that's what we do to protect the sites. So we oh. dig them and we record them. And then we, we um, uh, fill them up with sand again to protect what's Ooh. left because it's made of mud brick. It can deteriorate very fast. Now, there are some buildings that are still uncovered, like the, the house of the guy who made the, the Nefertiti bust. His house is mm -hmm. open for viewing. Um, one of the, the temples still has columns that you can see, and then one of the, the palaces you can also visit. Um, but for the entire city, it was a huge city. And I really wanted to see one of the suburbs, uh, the north suburb, because there was a really cool house where this one stila that was very important for my dissertation mm. was found there. But unfortunately, that is covered over with modern cultivation and <laughs> really? so you can't access the north suburb. Um, oh. uh, yeah, there, we do have the problem of encroachment, which, I mean, I don't blame people. Modern day people want to you know, live somewhere. So I get that. Um, but they are building walls to, to stop this encroachment. Um, but yeah, I was expecting to see the whole city and it was all buried under sand and it was this really bright white sand. Um, you can visit the rock cut tomb. So that's pretty much what you visit when you're there, which is great. And you can visit Akhenaten's tomb, which is so yeah. cool. You, you have to drive through the body, which is like the, the valley that's cut into the cliffs. And it's dead silent in there. It's so it's so cool. It's peaceful. Um, like it's hard to explain. It's so interesting uh, when you when you go through there. Um, and so when I played Assassin's Creed Origins, I did the DLC playthrough with Sasa, which is the organization I mentioned. And I made sure that I never visited Amarna until I played this DLC with with uh, the Sasa organization. And when I entered Akhenaten's afterlife, this is where they had Amarna reconstructed. And I cried <laughs> <laughs> when I saw it for the first time. There's a whole Oh wow. Of, yeah, they clipped it on, on Twitch so you can actually see me like <laughs> it was it was because I'd never seen it, it, it alive, right? And this is yeah. how I was able to see it in its full glory and experience it. So that goes back to you know how, why these That's games right. are important because That's right, some yeah. of these sites you can't actually see because they're buried, but you can see them in this game, mm. and that's a way that you can visit. And so for me, that was very emotional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, you know, again, speaks to the power of the medium, right? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what? Um, so it, it it's a hundred percent on my bucket list to visit, visit 
Egypt before I die. And I'm mm. sure it's on a lot of people's bucket list. It's, you know, a really popular place. Um, what other sites would you recommend for the tourists that, you know, maybe has a week in Egypt, you know, mm. pyramids of Giza aside, I, I, that's sure. a must, right? What else? I, I've never visited the Giza pyramids. I've never gone inside them. I went outside them, but never inside because they're hot inside and there are people inside. So <laughs> I want to avoid that. Um, I highly recommend visiting um, Saqqara and Dashur. And you can visit, they just opened the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid of um, Senwazret. Sorry, not Senwazret. Oh, God, what's his name? Uh, uh, Sneferu. <laughs> Hello, am I an Egyptologist? Um, and it's a full body workout. If you're interested in that, your your butt will hurt for a week, for sure. Um, it's really cool, and and so I think with the Giza pyramids, they bring in groups of people. But with these other pyramids, fewer people will visit, and so you can climb up to the very top. They 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 have these staircases, um, but also they have the original passages that you have to kind of crawl through, um, and then the, the the passage to get into the pyramid is it's a it's a very long passage. It's on a slant, and the roof is very low, so you're crouching the whole way, and you're going like seventy meters down. Um, wow. And so by the time you get to the end of that, you're going to have some wobbly legs. <laughs> um, but then you can climb staircases that they built inside to get to um, a higher level where they I can't remember which pyramid it was, but there was like this this uh, tunnel that was cut into the limestone so you crawl through there and then they erected another staircase and you can go to the top so this was at the very very top of the interior of the um you heard the cat yeah, <laughs> knocking over good. plates um and you you go to the very top of the interior chambers and it's so quiet that you can hear the blood in your ears wow it was so it was so cool um, wow. And it's just, it, it makes you think about the people who were building them and, and how they experienced this themselves. Because, well, I mean, there would be uh, many people in there, of course, building them. Um, can't imagine, so hot. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, so I would say that definitely go to Luxor because mm. you have all of the, you have Karnak Temple, you have Luxor Temple, you have the Valley of the Kings, um, you have the Daryl Medina, which is the, uh, the town site for the, the people who built the Valley of the Kings. Um, and then there, there are various temples there as well. And um, Hatshepsut's temple, I highly recommend. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So awesome. it's, that. it's very hard to go to sites that aren't the major tourist sites. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you want to go to Amarna, it's better to go with a tour group. I went by myself, and that was a disaster. <laughs> Uh, the police are very serious about their job, and if you are a single tourist, especially a lady, um, traveling by yourself and just randomly popping up in the middle of uh, Egypt where nobody else goes, the, the police will detain you, question you, mm -hmm. and I was put into a, 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 an army van and taken to my hotel with this army van, and you're supposed to have a, a, a police officer with you at all times. It's because, you know, they, they get nervous when you have um, yeah. tourists by themselves because, you know, it, maybe you might be stealing artifacts or, you know, kind of like a, an insurance for um, Egypt to make sure that if something happens to a tourist that nothing will happen to the tourist because they have the, the bodyguard. Um, that was really awkward at first. I was very scared by the uh, <laughs> the whole army situation because I didn't know that I was, that that was going to happen. They kind of That's just intense. Formed. Yeah. Wow. I was like, ah! <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then I was used to it by the end, and, and everybody was friendly, and they wanted to add me on Facebook, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. just uh, tell me your name, and, and I'll find you later. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was intense, but now now I know what to expect, and somehow it's it's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, well. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for um, the very interesting interview and the wonderful recommendations. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the show, and um, we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. This was so great, and, and I hope I, I answered your questions all right and didn't put a foot in my mouth too much. <laughs> no. 
But yeah, I'd love to, to, to chat with you again. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll I'll end the in the video recording there. Um, <laughs> if I can remember, I think I just have to end the stream. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks again. Um, I'll send you the uh, the link to the pre-published video before I publish it to get your stamp of approval and. Um, yeah, oh, let me at know. least I have to watch myself. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll cut out the part uh, where I asked you about the ethnicity of the Egyptians. If you don't want me to include that. I oh, think. okay. I think I think I think we we were fine with that. Um, okay. It is it is a whole can of worms that that I am not prepared for. Um, but if you are interested in interviewing a scholar on this topic, I would yeah. recommend contacting Solange Ashby who specializes in this topic, or um, Vivian Davies. I can send you an email uh, with their names as well. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, so I think I would say that they are the two leading scholars on these topics, on this topic. Um, but it is highly contentious, and yes. um, and I don't, I don't feel qualified to, to go into detail about it. But it is a very relevant topic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I 100% I, I get it. Yeah, if you don't mind, send me their um, names and or contact information if they're comfortable with that. Yeah, that would be awesome. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's up to them to, to reply, um, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to them, I don't think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again.